presentation, I just want to take a, a few minutes to do some housekeeping items. Uh, please note that the slides and recording will be posted to the CTAC website within the next few days. Um, also, just a reminder that there will be a brief question and answer period following today's presentation. Uh, we are asking that participants submit their questions at any point during the webinar, and we will do our best to address them. Uh, I do want to note that uh, we will, while we'll do our best to answer the questions uh, that are come in today, um, there may be uh, the possibility that we may not have the answer to them. And so we want to recognize that there will be some questions that we will not be able to address and we'll need to forward along to OMH for review. But it's still very helpful for you to post the question and for us to be able to relay that information forward. Um, questions can be submitted utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, if the box is not visible, please click on the dialog bubble and it should appear. Um, and also, just to remind you that if you run into any technical issues uh, during the webinar, that you can please feel free to chat to the host who should be able to assist you. Again, so while this webinar reviews best practices that support quality documentation and treatment planning um, as a core element of service provision, uh, providers will need to refer to state guidance documents for uh, official guidance. Uh, additionally, providers should follow internal agency policy and procedures uh, in alignment with the state-issued guidance and manuals. And as always, due to, the, due to the dynamic nature of our work, information is current as of the date uh, of this presentation. So just to uh, let you guys know what we'll be covering in today's presentation, we're going to discuss uh, quality documentation. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes to talk about pathways to care, uh, working with family for the benefit um, of the child. We'll briefly discuss some soft service authorizations. And again, as I mentioned before, we will have a brief Q&A at the end. Uh, this is, again, part one of a two-part series. Um, and so the part two of this presentation will go into more specifics related to treatment planning for FPSS, um, including how to write the FPSS goals and objectives um, and progress note requirements and tips. So again, and at the end of the presentation, uh, there'll be some information on uh, the day and time of uh, part two. So providers delivering CFTSS services should be with familiar with a variety of uh, resources. Um, this includes the CFTSS provider manual and the health record uh, documentation provider guidance. Uh, we've provided the links here uh, for your convenience, so I would encourage you to continue to check for um, updates posted in the state websites and on our website, CTAC, um, and announce via the listers. Uh, a number of relevant listers are posted at the end of the slide deck, and this will be how you will keep abreast of any updates. Um, also, while I just mentioned that there's a part two to this, there's another resource that we wanted to make you aware of. So on October 31st at 1130, there will be a webinar in which uh, state partners from the Division of Integrated Community Services for Children and Families uh, will provide a review of the official health record documentation guide, again, as you see and noted here. Um, and so you can find the registration information on our web website at uh, www.ctacnewyork.org. And so we talk about quality documentation. One of the things that we think is important to, to point out around it is that documentation actually tells a story. Uh, the story recounts the entire process of care, treatment, um, or services for a particular individual served. Uh, the story must be founded on timely, complete, accurate information continuously collected and analyzed. And so collectively, quality documentation allows for the appropriate assessment of needs and the ability to individualize care. Quality documentation supports and substantiates all the hard work done by providers and reflects the commitment to uh, the core principles. Uh, it improves coordination of care and helps the provider track progress towards goals. And remember that it serves as the official record for the family and provides evidence needed for reimbursement. So quality documentation is also helpful in informing um, quality improvement processes. And so again, uh, quality documentation is not only helpful for 
providers and for agencies, but for family, families as well. So I just mentioned the core principles and we have them listed here. And uh, these are the principles that are listed in the CFTSS provider manual. Uh, and of course are consistent with principles at the heart of FTSS, including family-driven, youth-guided, uh, trauma-informed, strength-based, and individualized care. Um, and so I think is while we're talking about uh, quality documentation, the one thing that we want to emphasize is that your documentation should reflect um, these core elements and, and the perspectives that uh, allows the, identifies that the parent and caregiver is an expert on their child and family, uh, identifies that, um, that you've kind of looked at all the natural and community uh, supports that will be critical to the family's long-term success, uh, that your goal is to really help empower the family and build resiliency, again, so that they'll be able to move forward utilizing those same skills and ensuring that they are getting their needs met uh, no matter what service system they're in. Um, that the services uh, can only be effective if they're delivered in a culturally respectful and responsive way. Uh, and that, again, you've, you've met with the family and that you've worked with them and uh, gathered information that helps you individualize uh, the, the plan to their unique needs. Um, so I think it's important just to kind of point out that these are some of the, uh, the core concepts that you want to try to capture when you are um, completing your documentation. And later on in the presentation, we'll give you some um, examples about how that's done or, you know, how that might look. And so ultimately, we just want to sum that up by saying that uh, your documentation, again, should just be reflective of the principles that guide your work, um, and that is evident in your documentation. And again, I, I won't go back through, and, uh, but just mention some earlier comments around how quality documentation really is uh, helpful for um, all involved, especially the family. But it also, again, as a provider, you do a lot of hard work, um, and we recognize that. And so it's helpful to be able to articulate your work um, in your documentation so that the people that you're working with, the family, um, is aware of all the um, hard work that has gone into it and that your um, notes demonstrate that. So here's an example of um, a note that kind of um, identifies some of those uh, core elements that we discussed. And so we wanted to really just uh, give you both a, a good example and probably a better example of how that might be done. Um, so if we look at this note here, it says, uh, we reviewed the LPHA recommendation regarding David's school issues with his father. The school does not understand the impact of David's social issues. The FDA will attend the next CSC meeting um, with the father to address the child's lack of friends, which is impacting his attendance, and the need for reading assistance. So referral was made to the parent support group so father can meet other parents whose children have similar needs. Now, again, I want to say the first, this note isn't uh, a bad note per se, but it doesn't fully capture the father's involvement and or his perspective um, and, and kind of what services he feels are needed, as well as the, uh, the family peer advocate's uh, kind of responsiveness to the family needs. And so uh, the other example that we want to provide that really kind of highlights some of those things I just noted is the second example. And so the FPA and David's father discusses the LPHA recommendation. The father understands the CSC process, but has been frustrated that the school isn't doing all they can do uh, because David is quiet and not a problem. Uh, the SPA helped the father choose two priority issues, uh, David's lack of friends, which his father feels is impacting his attendance, and the need for reading assistance. The SPA then offered to attend the CSC with the father who stated he will consider that. Um, SPA explained about a support group in town and at the father's request, um, and we'll check to see if any other fathers attend. And so this note does a better job really conveying that the parent was involved, um, that the parent chose the things that he wanted to work upon, um, and that's clearly um, noted here. Uh, it includes a relevant quote uh, versus, uh, by the father versus uh, the FPA's words. And so you'll see that quoted here. So it really kind of relates to sentiment and what he said. Um, 
The note also details the parent's strengths, uh, that the father understands the CSE process, so really it's not about his not understanding, but he, he actually feels he's not being heard, so that really provides some clarity there. Um, it also demonstrates uh, steps to build natural supports for this family, um, but also attends to the father's concern that he, uh, that he may uh, not be the only guy. Uh, and it reflects a little bit more of the parent's perspective on his son, what he feels to be his son's challenges and really kind of, um, you know, from, from the father's perspective. And then more specifically identifies what the FPA will do. So what they're going to be tasked with doing and working with this particular um, family. And so I want to provide you with um, a, another example that really kind of, again, uh, not, not horrible note, but uh, definitely can use some work in some areas. And so this is about Nina. And so the recommendation indicated that Nina is not getting enough sleep, which is having a negative impact on her behavior. Uh, Nina's mother shared that she's not following the pedi um, pediatrician's recommendation. FPA and mother discussed possible changes to the routine to increase Nina's sleep. Uh, and a referral was made to the county mental health uh, health for clinic services due to her nightmares. And now if we look at um, how we would uh, write a better note regarding Nina and her needs and needs um, identified based on um, talking with the family, we say recommendation indicated that Nina is not getting enough sleep, which is having a negative impact on her behavior. Uh, her mother shared she arrives home late and wants time with her daughter. So the FBA helped the mother brainstorm possible changes to the routine that can give them time, but also get Nina more sleep. Uh, Nina's mother also shared that Nina has been having nightmares since moving to this country. The FBA explained some options for getting Nina some support to cope with her fears, which included uh, some in-home services as the family's concerned about what others might think. And so I, I just want to point out here too, while, and I'll just flash back quickly to the, um, I'm sorry, to the previous note. If you can see here, the, the the point of writing the quality note is not necessarily about writing more. Um, the second note is not much longer than the first, but definitely gives you a different uh, perspective and view into what the, the problems are based on the family's um, input, you know, what they see as the issue, it gives you a, a better um, understanding of how you might help the family um, address some of those concerns. And so I think when we're talking about quality documentation, be able to, again, identify those core concepts and kind of bring that forward into the note. These are some of the things um, that we're speaking of. All right. So just to move on, uh, going in the wrong direction. My apology. Uh, the next thing that we want to take a moment to just kind of touch base about is the pathways to care. Um, and so recognizing that these are new services and uh, want to just make sure that everyone's on the same page regarding um, who can make a, a, a CFTSS referral, but also what that might look like in terms of documentation. So um, anyone can make a referral for these services, and that includes the parents, the youth, pediatrician, you know, other service providers. Um, but the um, determination for access has to be made by a licensed practitioner of the healing arts, who is the person who is able to discern and document medical necessity. Um, and so while you may not necessarily be writing this recommendation, um, you definitely will be on the receiving end of this. And how do you um, utilize this information and incorporate that into your documentation processes will, will be important. Um, so just a few other things to know. I mean, consistent with the CFTSS focus on prevention, uh, family peer support services is one of the six services. And so a, a child need not be enrolled in a health home to receive these services. Uh, they need not meet uh, HCBS eligibility in order to receive CFTSS. Um, and there are medical necessity criteria for family peer support services. And again, if you uh, look back into the um, beginning of the document where I provided um, some of those guidance documents, if you need more information relative to the medical necessity criteria for the FPSS service, uh, you can find it there. And so therefore, a recommendation is needed to um, establish medical necessity. 
and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. And so here is just a sample recommendation form of um, what you might receive as um, a service where someone has been referred to. This is the sample LTHA recommendation form. Again, once you have access to the slides, you'll be able to uh, click on the link and find it there. Um, but there are some things that must happen in order um, for the recommendation to be authorized. And so it must be in writing, clearly must be signed and dated, must include an explanation of the medical need for the service, and have the MPI number of the LPHA, the person who is doing uh, the recommending, and um, the agency if applicable. And so uh, the other thing that I want to say is information that you garner off of um, this recommendation form, uh, you may utilize as you um, identify in your documentation, you know, maybe reasons for um, reasons why you're seeing the family, you know, based on information that you've gathered from the recommendation form. And so you want to make sure that you're demonstrating that you're kind of, again, telling the story, so putting all of the pieces together and not in an exorbitant or elaborate way, but a way that it makes it clear in terms of um, what services you're providing and why it is that you're providing those services. And there are two ways that you might um, get a recommendation, so a referral might come to you uh, first and you will need to assist the family in obtaining a recommendation since perhaps they heard about the service, um, maybe just through some informal network and shows up at your door and is interested in learning more and perhaps accessing the services. Um, in that case, then you would need to refer um, that family or that individual to uh, an agency or a per uh, person. Uh, that you've identified or partner with who's able to um, complete the recommendation form. Um, and then there may be families that just come to you with this already completed. Um, and so basically what you're going to do is uh, take that and again, uh, you know, talk with the family and try to get an understanding of what exactly the needs are. Uh, the sample recommendation form includes the following information. Again, I won't read the slide entirely, but all of these pieces are going to be um, essential as uh, the person who is completing the recommendation form. And so you want to make sure that the information is complete, especially if you're getting it on the receiving end. Um, and again, while this is an example form, the form could be modified to meet your needs and purposes, so it doesn't need to uh, look exactly like uh, the form that I showed you, but again, the information on the form is going to be important and imperative. Um, and so you just want to be mindful, and maybe for your program or your agency, there may be some additional information that you want on the form um, because it might help you, you know, uh, assess the family faster and give you some additional information. And so you you are able to do that. You're able to add it to the form. Um, however, you do want to be cautious because you don't want to make um, the recommendation form too lengthy or um, cumbersome for folks who are trying to refer families to you. So, you know, you have to identify kind of what is the best um, mix and fit for, for your agency. Um, and also, if, this, if the recommendation form uh, or recommendation information is not completed, it will make it hard for you to really uh, do your job on the other end and also to include relevant information into um, your documentation. All right, so we're talking about um, when a new recommendation is needed. So just a few points here. Um, the recommending LPHA must have current knowledge of the child, uh, their functioning needs and diagnosis. So again, when you receive that um, information, it should be information that you're able to incorporate into your documentation. Um, if a child's needs change significantly and they need additional services, um, they will not need a new recommendation. Um, and, and so what happens is, you know, through the process of treatment planning and things like that, um, that you'll be able to update. And let me, let me go back, I think I just misspoke there. But so if the child's needs change significantly um, and they need additional services from what you're providing, they, they will need a new recommendation for that particular service. Um, but if it's the service that you're um, already providing as an FPSS, you're already providing particular services and, and needs change related to that service, 
um, then again, that will get captured in, in treatment planning and you will not necessarily need a new recommendation for that. But again, if they have um, other needs or something changes really drastically where they're um, in a need of additional services, um, for which you're not providing currently and you have not received a recommendation for, then you will need a new recommendation. And before seeking uh, Medicaid reimbursement, we know that documentation is an important part of making sure that you're um, receiving reimbursement and, and that it's substantiated, that you have um, reason and documentation to relay that these services were provided. You want to make sure that you know, the child has a recommendation for SPSS, uh, that they're currently enrolled in Medicaid, that the, your agency is in the child's uh, plan network, um, and you want to check with the family, the health home, or the plan to determine what services the child is receiving um, in order to improve coordination and prevent duplication. Uh, I know in this uh, current, you know, system, it, you may not necessarily know all of the services that a particular family or child is receiving, but how doing some outreach to their plan might help you determine um, that uh, a particular child has received um, some specific, has received some services from some other areas. And again, this is just a way that you want to make sure that you're not duplicating um, services because only one provider is going to get paid if it's considered a duplication. And so you really kind of want to mitigate that um, risk. And so you want to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Coppinger. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Yvette. Um, so uh, those of you who are familiar with Family Peer Support Services, I think will recognize the challenge that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides, which is the idea of describing the work that you do with the parents in a way that clearly links it to the needs um, of the child and the benefit that the child um, will, um, you know, obtain from the work that you're doing with the parent. So, uh, you know, it's a, it really is something that uh, once you wrap your head around it, it's not that difficult to do. And we're going to give some more examples in the part two of this when we talk about treatment planning and progress note writing. Um, but just uh, to kind of talk about some of the basics uh, and not go backwards. Um, the impact that this has on documentation is that um, it's important to remember that from Medicaid's perspective, the child or the youth is the beneficiary, not the parent. Um, they don't see the parent. You know, I'm saying the word see in quotes here. Um, obviously, they understand that parents are really an important resource for their children, and they understand that the well-being of the parent does, in fact, relate to child outcomes. Um, but the child is actually the, uh, you know, the beneficiary from Medicaid's perspective. So the work that you do with parents needs to be defined in your treatment plan and described in your progress notes in a way that connects the work you do with the parent to the child's goals and objectives. Um, and again, as people start to experiment with this, um, they find out that it's really pretty easy to map the work that you're doing with the parent um, onto the needs of the child, um, as long as that's, you know, really something that you are keeping in mind. Um, we get a lot of questions about um, the idea of what kind of an assessment does the Family Peer Support Program need to do once a recommendation comes to them from a licensed practitioner of the healing arts. So that person has done the basics in terms of establishing medical necessity. Um, you are kind of the next in line to confirm that. Um, and one of the big things you're going to confirm is that the parent um, wants the service um, and is willing to participate with you and work together with you because um, we're going to look in a minute at some of the specifics of medical necessity, but if the parent isn't interested and willing, um, they don't meet medical necessity. Um, and obviously that's something that you would respect as well and keep the door open. Um, so that's the first thing you're going to be kind of learning. Is this a service that you want to receive? And is it a service that you as a parent feel would be helpful to you and your child? Um, you'll want to discuss the parent's areas of strength um, and where they need support um, in relationship to helping their child make progress. Some providers use the Family Assessment of Needs and Strengths, otherwise known as FANS, as the basis for having this conversation with parents about what are the needs, what are the strengths, and how are you going to work together. 
Uh, SANS isn't required, although it is recognized by the Office of Mental Health. Um, agencies use all different kinds of uh, strategies and tools to gather this information, and what they're really doing is learning about the family um, and working with that family to, in the early stages of developing a treatment plan. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm gonna move the phone a little closer. We just heard that some folks are having trouble hearing. Is that better? If it's not, let us know and we'll uh, see what else we can do. Uh, okay, oh, yes. Okay, so um, these are the components of family peer support service that are billable to Medicaid. So you may do all kinds of things with families, um, but th these are the activities that um, are billable. And when you look at the uh, provider guidance document, you'll see you know, long lists of activities that could fall under um, these broad categories of engagement, bridging, and transition support, um, helping the parent with self-advocacy and empowerment, working on parent skill development, um, and uh, helping them make community connections and build up their natural supports. Um, these are pretty broad categories, so most of what you do really reasonably can fall under one of these. Um, it may be helpful in your documentation to actually have a system in which you check off. I'm working under this category. That's a very concrete way of, um, you know, signaling that you understand that the activity that you're doing is um, a billable activity. And just to point out that the list of um, the kind of examples that are provided in the provider manual, it's pretty, there are quite a few examples, but there may be other kinds of things that you do um, that could fall under these categories. It's not an exhaustive list. So I added this slide to kind of um, frame, uh, reframe again this issue of how you want to think about working with a parent for the benefit of the child. So you want to be able to ask this question and answer it. How can I support you to, for example, learn how the system works so that you can support your child? How can I help you navigate this big transition that your family is looking at in a way that will help you support your child to be successful with that transition? How can I help you understand your child's diagnosis so that you can take your current parenting strategies and adapt them in a way that will help you feel more effective in terms of helping your child? So this is the way that you want to be thinking about, um, you know, your work and how you're going to, uh, you know, come up with goals and objectives. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about service authorization. And some of you are probably saying, I thought I came to a webinar on documentation. Um, and you know, it's really important that all of this front work um, and ongoing work is uh, you know, accurate and up to date and in keeping with the principles of medical necessity um, so that the service will be um, reimbursable. Um, and that if the family needs additional services that you have documentation that indicates that they meet the criteria for uh, continuing the service. So just to review a couple of things, um, medical necessity answers this question. Is the service appropriate and necessary? Is this a service that the child needs to meet a need? Um, and is this the right service? So that's gonna be determined first by the LPHA and then also by you. Um, utilization management um, is a, refers to a set of procedures that managed care plans use to monitor or evaluate the clinical necessity, appropriateness, efficacy, and efficiency of behavioral health care services. So this is the plan, having a conversation with you and saying, is this service still necessary? Is it still the right service? Is it being done in the right amount? Is the child making progress? Do they still have goals that you need to work on? That's what utilization management is all about. So think about these three areas um, that have to do with service authorization. So you get a recommendation, uh, you meet with the family, your first three visits um, do not require, you don't need prior authorization, so you can start working with the family once you have that recommendation. Um, and the first three visits don't require any authorization. However, we highly recommend that you notify the plan that the child is enrolled in before providing services to ensure that you get paid in a timely way. That's an opportunity for the plan to say to you, hey, wait a minute, there's another person providing family support, or um, you know, we don't see them in our network. We, should, we, need, we need to look at that before you proceed because maybe they're in another plan's network. 
There are other ways um, that you can check on a child's Medicaid status and, and plan enrollment, but this is also a really great way to go about that. And it's a good opportunity for you to be in, in conversation with the plan and letting them know that you're about to begin work. So you're working with the family. Um, if more services are needed, um, the Medi Medicaid Managed Care Plan can perform concurrent review. And if the service is deemed medically necessary, they may authorize further services. The plans must authorize a minimum of 30 service visits as a part of that um, concurrent authorization. Plans are not required to perform concurrent review. However, if they choose to, they can't do it before the fourth visit. So by the fourth session or visit, um, and, and no more than 30 days after the first face-to-face -face with the parent or caregiver, because this needs to be happening you know, on a, in a timely manner, um, you'll have done an assessment of the parent and caregiver's needs and strengths, um, either through using the FANS or through other means. Um, you'll have worked with the parent to develop a treatment plan, including goals and objectives um, that's based on the LPHA recommendations and looks at how you're gonna work with the parent to help them help their child. Um, and that treatment plan will have to be signed, very important, by the parent or caregiver, um, by the family peer advocate, and by the family peer advocate supervisor. So um, in the, uh, one of the guidance documents that we referenced earlier, um, the, uh, the, the, it's referred to as the EPSCT CFTSS provider manual, um, you'll see lots of detail on medical necessity criteria. What you'll notice is that there are criteria that need to be met in order to admit a child to the service, for them to continue in the service, and for them to be discharged. It is a lot of bullets and numbers. It is not as complicated as it looks. So we're going to walk through it a little bit now, including some tips for how you're going to want to document things so that you're operating um, in a way that will demonstrate that medical necessity. So, to be admitted to family peer support services, the child has to have a behavioral health diagnosis or evidence of skills lost or undeveloped due to a physical health diagnosis. That child has to be likely to benefit from services to prevent symptoms from developing or getting worse. The family has to be available and receptive and interested in receiving family peer support services to work on skills that are within your scope of practice. Um, and that treatment planning clearly has to, um, when you write, you know, treatment plan has to have the family involvement um, and that you're going to need to demonstrate that. And again, they have to have the LPHA recommendation. So that maps pretty clearly onto what your notes should demonstrate. Um, you have to demonstrate that the parent was receptive. That's as easy as saying in your notes. Explain to the parent about family peer support services. Um, and we discussed what that might look like for their family. Um, they are interested in continuing. Um, you have to demonstrate that there's a need for the service. So you have to be able to say, the parent indicated that they could really use some help in these three areas, and this is what we're gonna do to, um, to work on those in a general sort of way. The more specific what we're gonna do to work on that will be expressed in the treatment plan. And you also have to um, express how the parent was involved in the treatment planning. So, um, you know, some of those notes that Yvette um, shared earlier uh, clearly demonstrate the parent's involvement um, and their interest, and they begin to hint at the kinds of things that the, uh, you're going to be working on. So, continuing stay. So, this is, this may, the plan may or may not come back to you um, looking for a concurrent review. Um, if they do, this is the kind of um, information that they're going to be looking for to see if the service is still medically necessary. Does the child still meet admission criteria? Do they still have a diagnosis? Do they still have a need, um, you know, issues that would be consistent with making that recommendation? Is the child making progress but not fully reach their goal? So this is a balancing act. You want in your pro every progress note to indicate when there's been progress. If there hasn't been progress and you, it's been a period of time, you'll certainly want to be explaining how you've switched up your um, activities or your interventions to try to help there be progress. Um, but you also want to make it clear that you're still working toward a goal. If a child has achieved all of their goals and objectives, then maybe it's time for discharge. But if you don't feel that it's time for discharge, 
um, and the parent is still uncertain about some of the areas in which you're providing support for them on behalf of their child, then you're going to need to update your treatment plan. Because what will be a problem is if you indicate that everything's good and all the, all the progress that you, you know, wanted to see has been made, but you're asking for additional units of service, you're not going to be approved for that. So again, it's a, it's, you know, it's a matter of just keeping things moving and regularly updating the treatment plan. We'll talk next time about required treatment plan update timeframes, um, but treatment plans can and should be updated any time that um, you know, progress is made and you need to update those goals and objectives. Or when something changes that's significant or you want to add an area that you haven't been working on before. So you also have to demonstrate that these additional services will contribute to the child or youth's progress. So that is where you say, this is where we're headed. I feel like if we work on this for another month, uh, the parent's skills will be in this place and that will help them do this for their child. Um, you also um, need to be clear that the child doesn't require more intensive care. So that's really, um, you know, in some ways that's something you'll write about more often when you're discharging a child and saying this service really isn't appropriate because they need this higher level of, um, of service. Um, the child or youth uh, is, still needs to be at risk for losing skills um, if the service is not continued. So again, that kind of goes hand in hand with the way, the way that you're going to describe how continuing work will help you reach um, an important future goal. So, and again, each time um, you want to show that treatment planning includes the family, youth, and other supports. And when you have those treatment plan review meetings um, and you write the notes based on those meetings, you're going to want to capture the family's involvement. So, um, these are some tips that, um, you know, we kind of went over on the last slide um, that uh, you'll have that you can take a look at later, but we've pretty much talked about all of these. Um, and just be sure that in the context of writing your progress notes, you are describing your intervention. It's pretty common uh, for uh, providers to talk all about how the child and family are doing, but just fail to mention that what they did. Um, and so you're going to want to say, you know, help the parent outline three priority goals that they're going to have in mind when they go into the CSB meeting. Worked with the parent to uh, brainstorm, uh, you know, possible changes in their family routine so that the child can get more sleep. Um, provided the family with information on their child's diagnosis and what that might mean uh, for steps they can take to help improve sibling relationships. You want to make sure that you and your work and your interventions show up uh, in your documentation. And again, update that treatment plan whenever you need to. So when it comes to discharge, um, the, uh, there could be a number of different reasons why a child is discharged from family peer support services. It might just be that the family doesn't need the service anymore. Um, it might be that the family doesn't want the service anymore, or maybe the family has disengaged in a less clear way. So you're going to want to make sure that when you're documenting discharge, um, you keep some things in mind. Um, and that includes um, make sure you include evidence um, that goals and objectives have been met. Or if they haven't been met and it's what you might consider to be a discharge that's happening before you think is ideal, you might want to talk about how they've been partially met. Um, you want to provide an explanation that progress um, isn't being made and why. So if progress isn't being made, I hear um, those of you who do this work frequently talk about situations in which uh, the family peer advocate realizes that they're doing more work than the parent um, or the parent is just, just for whatever reason not um, able at that time to make progress so that your help isn't really helpful anymore, you're going to want to explain that. Um, if the child, if, if it is an unplanned discharge, you're going to want to talk about, like, if the family just stops showing up um, and, you know, or isn't, uh, you know, isn't really actively involved anymore, you're going to want to talk about what you did to re-engage them. Um, and if, the, if it's an appropriate um, discharge and you feel like things are in good shape, you're going to want to talk about what kinds of ongoing supports in the community, um, natural supports and community supports, as well as any services that are going to um, be taking place going forward, um, and put some details in there about that. So um, we want to leave some time for your questions. I just want to point out that uh, part two of this webinar 
um, where we'll talk in more detail about treatment planning and progress notes is next Wednesday at 1.30. And uh, the registration link is both on our website under the uh, upcoming events tab. Um, if you navigate to October 23rd, you can register that way, or when you get these slides, you can register here. Um, and we're going to um, take a look at the questions you've submitted. Um, and while we look at those questions, um, we're going to go over some resources that will also be in the slide deck um, when you receive it. So, um, there are some resources that CTAC has related to documentation. So, uh, many of you have already um, learned a little bit about the CTAC Self Learning Center um, through the Parent Empowerment Program training modules. There is also um, a series of modules related to quality documentation. These are general, they're not specific to family peer support, but they're really helpful and I encourage you to check those out. And if you're a supervisor, maybe this is something you could do with your staff or encourage your staff to do. There are some of the PEP training modules themselves have to do with aspects of documentation, so they might be worth reviewing or even using as the basis for an in-service training with your team. Um, this is the uh, main uh, website for the state where the state is gathering a lot of the resource documents that um, are referenced and it's worth bookmarking because things get updated. Um, this is a link where you can learn more about the family assessment of needs and strengths um, training opportunities if you choose to participate in that. These are state mailboxes. Uh, we really can't stress strongly enough that if you have any questions around documentation, um, now or in the future, um, or if you just want to double check what you've heard, please use one or more of these mailboxes. Also email us um, and we'll, we'll work with our state partners to try to get answers to your questions. These are some listservs we recommend that you sign up for because this is where changes and new announcements will be released. Um, it's also a great idea to sign up for our listserv because then you'll get the digest, which includes a lot of these resources as well. But um, I encourage everybody to sign up for everything because different things seem to come through different channels. Uh, and this is our contact information. And um, I think with that, we'll um, take some questions. Yeah. So, so we do have a couple questions that have come in. I think one of the first questions that we see is asking around uh, treatment planning. Do we have a sample of treatment plan that was written by an FPA for their services? And so. Um, and I'm not sure if, you, if you're if you familiar with a resource. Um, I'm not familiar with a sample treatment plan that we would have, but I do want to say a few things about treatment planning. Um, I think it's important if you um, think about what what's within your role and your scope, you want to make sure that the whatever you're writing in terms of treatment planning is indicative of what, you, what your role is. And so you don't want to be, um, you know, putting putting goals and objectives unrelated to what you're supposed to be working on the family with. So I think that's important. I also want to stress that in writing a treatment plan, I know sometimes that just makes gets people unnerved, but really um, a, a treatment plan, you know, should be just as simple as, you know, what are the goals identified that you've, that you've identified through assessment of the family in a variety of ways? And what is it, what are the most pressing issues? I always tell folks treatment plans don't have to have 10 goals and you know however many objectives. You can start really simple and you can start really brief. I actually recommend uh, you know not having too many because the family will not be able to work on all of those at one time. So it's it, it's better to kind of start small um, and be able to cross some things off the list. And again, as you're working with the family, things are changing. You're going to need to update the treatment plan anyway. Um, and so you want to do that. So while I don't have an example, again, I just just a few reminders to make sure whatever goals and objectives you're working on, they're within your scope to work on with that particular family. Um, and again, don't don't overload them um, in, in the plan because again, it'll be it'll be too much for the family as well. And so you should just be mindful of that. We get a lot of questions about um, are you required to submit the treatment plan to the Medicaid managed care plan, and you're not. Um, they could ask to see it at some point in time, and it's, you absolutely have to have one um, on, you know, in your documentation because that's part of that golden thread concept where um, the LPHA recommendation and those assessments tie to the treatment plan, tie to the progress notes, and that's, that's what, um, you know, gives you sort of 
that, um, that thread that allows you to um, seek reimbursement and then have appropriate um, documentation that you're doing the right thing. But the other, um, the other question we get with family peer support, because you, know, you all know sometimes it takes a little while for you to fully get to know the family, um, and people have um, you know, expressed some anxiety about having to write a treatment plan too soon. I think that point is really well taken here, and that is that you can write a very simple treatment plan to get started. And then as you learn more about the family and you kind of settle into, all right, this is what we're gonna work on for the next little while, then you update that treatment plan. Um, I think it's a real myth that treatment plans are these static documents that never change. It, you don't wanna be changing it every week, but um, after you get to know the family a little bit better, you can update that treatment plan. Um, are there other mm -hmm. questions here? Yep, there's a couple. So there's a question around the fact that some families are struggling to get recommendations, the medical necessity for these services. And the question is, is there any way we can build to support families uh, during uh, assessing these services? So essentially these are services pre-recommendation. Yeah. So um, you cannot seek Medicaid reimbursement prior to having a recommendation. However, um, if you're a, a designated, uh, OMH designated provider of family peer support services, um, which is why you would be looking for Medicaid reimbursement anyway, um, and you also have uh, 1650 state aid funding, you can allocate the time that staff spend working with families in order to obtain a recommendation to that other funding stream, or for that matter, any other funding stream. Like you may have a grant um, that is not very restrictive, um, and that might be something that could cover the time that you spend prior to obtaining the recommendation. Yeah. Um, and so I also wanna just point out that I think part of doing these new services does require a little bit of a different kind of shift in mindset in terms of really partnering with community agencies or really trying to get out there and figuring out who, who might you be able to uh, send families that come to you with no recommendation? You know, perhaps you could partner with another agency in the area um, who, who would be able to do the recommendation. I think ultimately what we wanna try to do is not have the family struggle in trying to find that resource, but really providing a link whenever possible. And so I think it just, I think it behooves us as, um, you know, as the service providers to really kind of get out and see if we can network with folks who would be able to, um, you know, who be able to do that recommendation and on this, you know, at the same time might also drive business in both directions. Yeah. And I, I think that it really um, would probably be helpful if you look at how the current uh, children and families that you provide services to came to you. Um, and work with those referral sources um, if they happen to have LPHAs on their staff and help them understand what this recommendation process is all about and how it will work. Um, so I know one provider that gets a lot of their referrals from a large pediatric practice and they're working with that pediatric practice um, to train them about what family peer support is so that they're writing recommendations that make sense and they're not sending family support recommendations that ask family peer advocates to do work they're not qualified to do. Um, but also just let them know the kinds of ways in which family peer support can help them and help the families that are in their practice. So it will be different based on your referral patterns. Um, and I also think you will have new referral patterns in this uh, new world. So you may want to go out there and look to meet with the school district and the CSC um, committees in your catchment area. Um, and if they have licensed professionals on staff, they may even be able to uh, learn how to write those uh, recommendations. Forms. So we have a question that says, I'm going to read it so out loud so I can hear it and you all can hear it. Can you please clarify if there is one treatment plan for the child that includes all CFPSS components or is there a separate treatment plan for FPSS? So this is a tricky question, right? Because um, the children who receive family peer support services may only receive family peer support services. They might receive family peer support and another CFPSS service like youth peer support and training or PSR. They might or might not be receiving HCDS, home and community-based services, and they may or may not be enrolled in a health home. So this is, relates back to the suggestion that we made early on 
that you have conversations with the family, with the managed care uh, plan, um, and if, with the health home, if the child is enrolled in a health home, to try to get a handle on the different services that the family receives. But each CFTSS service does require its own treatment plan. That doesn't necessarily mean completely separate documents because you may work in an agency that provides two or three services to one child and his or her family, in which case your EHR can probably knit those treatment plans together in a way that looks seamless and yet is still able to produce a separate set of goals and objectives um, for um, family peer support services itself. So the idea, the gold standard here is to have a really integrated plan. I think we're all really learning how is that actually going to work, and I think it will depend on um, the ways in which children are receiving these services, um, and it's, it's going to be a little tricky for a while. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a question here around how many services uh, someone is able to supply in a six-month period of time, and I just want to uh, refer that person back to um, the billing guidance because there are some limits noted in um, the provider billing guidance, and so it will kind of outline exactly how many units per day um, you're able to provide the services. And so um, if you have a question around that, that those uh, documents, again, uh, in the, that we introduced um, in the beginning of this webinar, but also um, if you go to the uh, DOH website, you will find a provider manual, provider billing manual that will give you those details. I also want to say that in the case that, I mean, there's been a lot of talk around limits and how much services uh, can be provided, I think uh, we'd be remiss without acknowledging that um, while there is a limit in terms of, it's a limit noted in terms of uh, how much services can be, pro be provided, if you find that um, an, a family or a child that you're working with is really in need of some additional services above and beyond what, uh, what the provider manual has noted as the limit, I would encourage you to reach out to the managed care plans and reach out to the state to see if you're able to access um, additional services. I, I think um, there's sometimes where there's some extenuating circumstances, so uh, I just want to want to caution you while that is the general limit so based in the provider manual that if you have some extenuating circumstances uh, that you reach out again to the plans or to the state to see if they could be of any assistance regarding um, that limit. So if someone's asking if they work in a school setting, does this apply to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a tricky question. I, I think it really, it, it, first of all, I think we have to have a little bit more information to really answer that question because if you're working, um, it, it's different if you're working doing these services in a school environment versus you're employed by the school doing work with the, the children. So I think that is, um, a challenging question to ask. I will say that CFTSS services, FBSS services uh, can be provided in the school, but you have to be careful that it does it is not interfering with some of those other uh, regulations and requirements in terms of a school setting. So it's a bit of a tricky question. I would say that it's not off limits, but you really have to be clear and have to know what the regulatory statute is and what your role is. Um, in that process to really determine if it's okay if you uh, provide that service in that setting. I think that's a great example of a question that we can, it's come up before and the state has um, discussed issuing some guidance on that and that's something we'll bring back to them to see if we can get some clarity. There are a lot of rules related to not duplicating what's required of the school district under IDEA. So that's where you have to be careful that you don't get on the wrong side of, of those rules. Um, but if you are an external provider and the school just happens to be a good location for you to provide the service, um, that's allowable, um, provided that you're not interfering with the child's education. So there's a question around whether or not staff need to have an MPI number to bill, so an MPI Number, and we've done some uh, previous trainings on uh, MPI numbers too, so I do want to refer you back to our MCTAC website, which would provide some of this information. Um, but staff, you know, they do need an MPI number or at least the agency MPI number to bill. 
um, I believe, but again, you could find further clarity and guidance in some of those, uh, those materials that we've done previously. We actually have a webinar um, that speaks to both the MPI number and the Medicaid uh, provider enrollment number. So uh, there's another question here about um, can we get samples of comprehensive therapy progress notes to have an idea of what should be included and how the notes should be structured based on expectations from Medicaid and managed care. So um, next week, um, we, we are going to do a webinar that looks at treatment plan best practices and progress note best practices. Um, and again, I think it's important for us to really clarify that we're outlining um, elements of best practice um, and that the state guidance has additional um, guidelines, but that um, it's, it's, uh, there is no such thing as a template or a perfect a uh, way that we can actually, you know, lay it out for you in step one, two, three, four, and five. Um, we feel confident that if you follow the state guidance, um, and that that will be reflected in the webinar we do next time, as well as in the webinar on October 31st, um, that you'll be in good shape. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some basic things that um, you need to make sure uh, happen, and, and we'll communicate that to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have a couple more questions. We have a few more minutes. So the, the one question uh, that I have is how do how can we continually do outreach with health homes and managed care plans without funding for this work? I uh, will say I'm not sure that I have the magical answer to that. I do think um, that that could be a challenge, and I think uh, from an organizational kind of standpoint, you have to assess uh, kind of what is needed in terms of outreach in order to ensure that you're able to service um, the individual appropriately. Um, and so I think that's, you know, again, not necessarily a question that we can answer. I think we all recognize that there are challenges when you're doing some care coordination and, um, or, and I, I probably shouldn't say care coordination because that's really the care, care manager's job, but more like trying to collaborate and make sure that you understand the full needs of um, the individuals that you're serving. And so there naturally will be some need to kind of reach out to other um, sources. And so I'm not sure there, there is an answer around funding for that work. Yeah, there isn't. I mean, I think there's a couple different reasons for you to be doing outreach. Um, certainly having a good relationship with the Medicaid Managed Care Plan is gonna be in your best interest. Um, and you may wanna think about how that works in your agency. Maybe it's one person that is the primary point person with the plan. Um, you may want to, you know, communicate with the plan when you get a family that, that's new in services because, as you all know well, asking a family what services they receive doesn't necessarily get you the information that you need because they don't necessarily know the official names of these services. They know that, you know, Mike comes on Tuesday and, you know, Sarah comes on Friday, but they don't necessarily know what those services are. Um, the plan is the one place uh, and the health home, if the child is enrolled in health home, that should know that information. Um, and hopefully some efficient practices can be put in place um, for you to uh, be in communication with them. As far as general outreach goes, um, I hear a number of family care support programs uh, struggling a little bit right now with getting referrals. And um, when I explore that more completely with them, what I hear is that they're relying on referrals from um, health homes and from provider agencies that also provide these services. Um, what I'm gonna recommend that you really contemplate the beauty of CFTSS services, which is that you can work with children. Children can meet the medical necessity criteria for these services. Children who don't meet the criteria for HCBS services or who may not be eligible for or interested in being enrolled in a health home. So, um, especially if you're used to working in the waiver. Um, you're now in a new world with these CFTSS services, and I would really strongly encourage you to continue those relationships with your traditional referral sources, but also um, really get creative. And again, it's a question of time and resources, I understand that, about reaching out to some potential new referral sources where you can help children and their families earlier on in their journey and hopefully um, really make a positive impact in that way, both on them and also on your ability to sustain your program through an adequate number of referrals. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we'll just, we just have one last question, and I think we just need a bit more clarity around it. Um, and so the, the question is, what kind of trainings are available for psychosocial defensive documentation? 
um, I don't think we quite understand the question uh, and, and to be order, in order to um, answer it accurately. So if we're just gonna ask for that individual just to provide some clarity for us um, and recognizing that it is uh, 3.30, you know, definitely send that in and we'll try to uh, respond to your question on an individual basis uh, once we understand quite what the ask is. The last thing I'd ask you to do, um, you're gonna, as soon as this webinar ends, a survey will pop up. I'd like to ask you to complete that survey. Um, it's always great for us to know what was helpful, what could we have focused more on. But in particular, I'd like you to use today's survey as an opportunity to tell us um, what you really wanna be sure we address in next week's webinar on treatment planning and documentation. That'll be really helpful so we can make adjustments um, in that presentation to best meet your needs. Um, as always, we thank you for your uh, participation. We invite you to reach out with additional questions um, and um, let us know what you're learning along the way too because you know, crowdsourcing the answer to these questions is really, um, uh, really helpful for everyone. So thank you very much um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week.